Hello, everyone. Thank you. Welcome. <laughs> this is stupid pen tester tricks or great sysadmin tips. They typically are complimentary. So this Ooh. is a conversation for the most part. We're all professionals. We know our shit, but we don't know everything. So if you have something to say, speak up. Don't raise your hand. Stand up. Just just yell out. Join the conversation. Every single person here has something to offer, whether it be the opportunity to learn or the opportunity to teach. So this is me. And this next year is Brad, who you may know. And of course, the infamous smelly belt face. I smell really bad, especially <laughs> today. I haven't showered. So I'll be covering internal network pen testing. So there's a, a lot of debate on what it really is. This is how I pretty much define it. It's goal-based where we're going after a specific target like credit cards or personal health information, personal identifiable information, sensitive data, or validated bone scan. Validated phone scan is you're checking every single port, every single service, every single aspect and component. And that's wonderful, it has its place, but to me it's not true pen testing. So, a lot of the components I see on internal pen tests, their uh, networks are nice, they're, they're in pleasant places, they want users to be able to do whatever they can, whatever they want to do. So, uh, some of the protocols I see that are, are very pleasant, link local multicast name resolution protocol, multicast DNS, Name, that files and name service. And they, they pretty much tell you, hey, I'm looking for this thing. Can you tell me where it is? And by the way, here's my credentials. Any of you guys ever used those before? Raise your hands. Anyone? Anybody? Ever? Oh, don't, not you, dude. Shut up, Viz. <laughs> <laughs> At least someone in the Yeah, we're, we're not, we're going to get, like, not violent. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. Does anyone else here use Responder, LLMNR, spoofing? One, two, two. Tell people are. Cool. Well, if you haven't seen it before, give it a shot. And actually, the next slide is going to kind of go into that. So, Really cool tool if you're doing an internal pen Hey, test. why not? So this is an example of Responder running on a network where NetBIOS name service is functional as well as multicast DNS. And if you haven't heard of multicast DNS before, it's typically in a, used in a situation where there's not a, a local name server. It's deployed easily so people can uh, just find things when regular DNS fails or uh, their host files fails. Essentially, yes, absolutely. Um, it's it's typically not it's turned on automatically. So, oh, by the way, if you do speak up or throw something in, there's beer and bourbon. So just come on up and grab one. And if you Here want you go, one Ms. now, just come on up and grab one. For being a smartass. No, no, no. <laughs> no, it's like icing. You're getting ice. You're getting coarse. No, bourbon. No, fuck coarse light. Get away from me. Ah! <laughs> what are you doing? I'm unzipping your pants. <laughs> why, why are you giving there away go, my beer, dude? My beard. You know this. There's like I 30. Beer into me. <laughs> <laughs> hey, that's my favorite beer. Knock that shit off. <laughs> well, I'm going to start for it. And it might hurt. Oh my God. Just put it inside you. <laughs> wow. So it's just going to go downhill from here. <laughs> so what do you drink? You actually raised your hand. Can you pull that? So, yeah, Responder is pretty kick-ass. It actually has a lot of functionality and components other than just L link local multicast name resolution protocol, multicast DNS, and uh, NetBIOS. You can actually insert, like, executables in line where people are forced to download them, uh, force WPAD off it, so they have to enter their credentials before that window go away. It's pretty much like easy mode pen test. So if you have any of these protocols running, make sure you go through to Microsoft, get the things that are that they recommend for configuration because those configurations where stuff puts out there are correct and accurate and will mitigate these problems. So another aspect that's just kind of easy mode pen testing. When I first go in, is I look and talk to I I can't, you know, seresolve.conf, find out where the DNS server is, and DNS is typically running in a domain controller. So I can now I can do an already cycling attack against that domain controller and get usernames. So in here we can see there's enum for Linux asking the domain controller where, you know, who do you have, what do you know, what's out there. And I've catted out a uh, list of domain admins. So that gives me an easy list of people to start going after. And that being said, what do we do when we have a list of usernames but no passwords, but, you know, brute force attack. So typically some of the things I'll do with a brute force attack when I have a list of usernames in domain admin or anywhere else is I'll take the season of what we're in, so like summer, and then the year, 2015. And I'll get at least three accounts. And those three accounts, all I need really is one. I figure out where that user can log in, and I start dumping things on that workstation. Can any of you guys read that? 
No. Black. This is a shitty slide, black, and I right? admit that, seeing it now right. in present. Noob move. Noob move. Right there. I get to troll, too. <laughs> <laughs> so. <laughs> so this is, we've all seen this. Those of us have, who have pen tested before have, have done this sort of thing. It's pretty much easy, easy mode. So one of the things I like to recommend to people when they're creating new accounts or if they have Windows Server 2012 to implement the password restriction components to um, creating accounts, you can actually put in there that summer is a disallowed word or company name is a disallowed word. And that'll prevent a lot of the components here we're seeing with uh, easy mode on getting passwords. So another thing I'm still seeing, I don't believe it, I really don't, is MS 08067. So how many people here have seen 08067 recently? Yesterday. On an engagement. On an engagement. Yesterday, Yesterday. I thought you were here. On every domain controller. Really? That all ran on Windows 2003. Last year. Wow. On every this, device. try to keep it in your pants, though. On every medical device? <laughs> <laughs> what? Oh, my God. You serious? You're funny about medical devices. Well, I'm not surprised. This is terrible. What? Jesus. Okay, you, you, you have to drink like four coups there. You said a lot. Bourbon. <laughs> oh, fine. Here. Bourbon here, it is. Here, here. It's actually really good. So whenever I see like a 2003 box or an XP box, I definitely am going to go after and check it out, see if it has 08067. I've actually seen stuff as far like the old school, like uh, 06040 out there. It's just, this is a, this is a problem with patch management. If, and especially when you have devs on your network and they're like, dude, I need it to be 2003 unpatched. I'm like, no, you don't, asshole. On the plus side, though, they are likely clean from Configure. <laughs> so alternatively, we still have things that are copping up daily, if not, you know, or weekly, if not daily. So this is, you guys have heard of MS14, or 15034, that vulnerability in uh, HTTP.sys. This is a proof of concept checker written by Laurent Legaffe, who is a very sexy Canadian man who actually also wrote Responder, um, where it's going out and checking to see whether HTTP.sys is responding appropriately for F15034 to operate. If it does, cool. Unfortunately, there are guys out there that spent the $13,000 to buy the exploit from Leet's whatever code dropper, where they sold the O-Day off for 13000 bucks. That's cheap. That's nothing, especially for an attacker trying to get access to big companies like Sony or whoever. So one of the things that's, you know, we're all telling clients all the time, and I'm sure, but here's a song to kind of help you out. So just keep patching. Really? So um, another component I'm seeing, this is uh, FTP anonymous. We're seeing people don't typically secure FTP internally because it's just FTP, right? Who cares? Nobody's going to go after it. Unfortunately, um, what I saw here on this particular client is uh, they were a financial institution and they had something uh, that was indexing every single transaction that ever occurred on their network for their clients, for their small customers, for anybody who had a card or an or account with them. And so I found this folder, 2007, 2008, et cetera. I'm like, all right, let's go into 2008. Oh, look at that. That's 1 through 12. Interesting. Looking to go through 5 because my birthday's in May. So 5. Oh, look, there's a bunch of like days numbered out there. I wonder what's in those folders. And I, out, I go in, and there's credit card numbers. It was actually a flat file. It was influenced by some giant big four consulting company for them to go ahead and make sure they have transaction logs. And what they were doing is they were dumping this to an anonymous FTP server, where it was, you know, read, write, all the fun stuff, catted it out, whole bunch of, like, gibberish. Then I stringed it, and, oh, my God, this is obviously somebody's financial information. So, search your credit cards and there you go. But dude, like if you don't, no, like no one's going to guess that there's not a password. It's totally <laughs> legit. No, absolutely. It's proper configuration internally, absolutely. <laughs> huh? Absolutely. That's said, but true. And I work for a major credit card company. I'm not going to say which one. If you guys want to dox me, whatever, I'm on LinkedIn, but. Fuck it. It's on LinkedIn. <laughs> and uh, so, so far it's pretty much been like configuration problems, right? You're, you're misconfiguring something. You're not configuring something. And that kind of still leads into a lot of things I do see in this next slide here. 
Um, this is an example of somebody who has properly configured Bash to disallow pseudo use for a regular user account. However, what they didn't do is C-shell. So great, I can go ahead, I'm gonna type in sudo and try and do whatever I wanna do. Oh wait, can't use sudo. Well, let's change shells, and now I'm roots. So one of the key things that should be taken away from that is you, if you're going to implement something to secure your environment, make sure you're doing it across all planes of access. So if FTP, Telnet, whatever, SNMP, uh, different shells available on Linux boxes, Unix boxes, whatever you wanna do, just make sure it's it's all prevalent and, and, and pushed out to everything. Because otherwise you're gonna find a guy like me who will switch shells on you. And you're, you're thinking to yourself, well, that's not fair. Well, yes it is. I'm an attacker, that's what I do. So simple over oversights lead to major problems. And that would be my portion of the internal pen testing here. So I was Rocky, up next is Bowie Cole. Uh, <laughs> fuck you. <laughs> <laughs> no, there's no kids in here, right? No. no kids? I don't even need this damn mic. You can all hear me without it, right? Yeah. Oh, the video. This, is, this shouldn't be recorded. Is it? It's being recorded, but not disseminated. It's being recorded, but uh, all right, I guess I can just say. All right, so how many of you guys actually do physical penetration testing? Not you. I don't even know why you're in here, Miss Black Badge, winner of Social Engineering DefCon. Yeah, she won the uh, Social Engineering Challenge at DefCon, the entire CTF. Here Everybody, give her a round of applause. She's badass. Good job, Snow. All right. So basically, when I go to do physical uh, cold penetration testings, I just walk in. We all know tailgating is the easiest way to get in. That's the easy mode. Uh, other ways of tailgating that I've done, uh, you know how people are dumb and they are very warm hearted? Well, if you have a full hand, full of both hands, with Starbucks and walk up to the door like this, I mean, people kind of tend to open and hold the door for you. You better give that guy one of those Starbucks though. But what happens when you can't get in by tailgating? Uh, let's see. Go ahead and flip that since I'm not working his machine. I'll work so it. the Starbucks is one of them. I actually have pulled a server out of a data center because I walked in with a TV box, big LCD TV box. Basically, it was empty when I went in. I had a 1U when I left. <laughs> so people are really warm-hearted. They hold the door for you. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, I've pen tested government facilities. I've pen tested military facilities. Surprisingly, the military facilities are the ones that I get in the most. I've had a, a data center that did not allow me in and had a gun pulled on me. Would you? Think seriously, like, you know, you got tons of fucking uh, monitoring equipment, which are usually TVs, right? Or, yeah, hey, man, I can't watch hockey games at my house, so. I mean, I used to work at a data center, and, um, I mean, we were we had, like, five data centers across the country, massive. But, I mean, we had TVs in all of them because we always had an on-site support staff, and up there they had Nagios, they had, you know, uh, traffic statistics and that sort of thing. And trust me, man, when you're bringing in, like, a 52-inch plasma screen TV or whatever you're bringing in, no one's going to question it. All they see is, <laughs> Xbox. So so that that's my big win. Another one is we all know who semantic is right you guys can't really see this but that's me on a semantic id and the greatest thing it's just a piece of paper <laughs> but i've gotten into facilities with bat with this badge alone or uh, i've actually what worked a physical with alex here and he went into the facility a day before took a nice little picture with his phone in the common area we got the picture of the badge, printed our own badges, tailgated in. Tailgating is literally by far the easiest. The other ones are these when you can't tailgate. That's, that's when you got to think outside the box. It sucks, though, when you get a gun pulled on you. I will tell you that right now. When I worked at Lockheed, I did a lot of SCADA, which the SCADA I did also were on waterways. So that means the Coast Guard is the ones who are protecting it, not just the private security. So when I gained access to those, I just know, get on my knees, put my hands behind my head, and tell the officer I have something in my back pocket, I can get it, or you can get it. Usually, they get it. 
All right, go to the next one. Huh? Oh, yeah. Another one, my boss actually told me about this. I have posed as a plant waterer. Now, <laughs> support staff are usually never questioned when you're doing physicals. The downfall is I had to be the part of a plant waterer for about an hour until the guy went away. So I was sitting there watering plants for an hour until I could find a spot to drop an odroid. Now, an odroid, anybody knows what that is? Better than raspberry pies, man. Faster, stronger. Oh, that one's yours. Yeah? What's really badass, though, is you can put Cali on it. That's the best part about the Odroid. And it's got its own little wireless, well, wireless modules. And, but you drop that thing, have it beacon out, that's the greatest thing. You don't even have to be on site to do anything anymore. You just do your physical real quick, plug this bitch in, walk out to the hotel, and do your remote hacking from there. So another one, employee of the company, you know, like he did, took a picture of the badge. I printed out the badge, never once asked a question. And then the employee of a well-known company, i.e. semantic incident response. Uh, some of the cool tools I have, and uh, Viz actually just pointed them out. So I don't know if any of you see me walking around today, but all three of these things I'm holding in my hand are cameras. So when we're on physical pen tests, you're supposed to be able to document everything you do. But you're not going to be sitting there pulling out your camera, taking a picture of everything. But now if you're walking around with a pair of glasses here, well, this isn't really too professional. But if I hang it here or put it in my pocket, there's still a camera right there. And I can document everything. Now if I'm going the geek mode, pocket protector, this nice little camera right here, 32 gigs. I got a couple of hours worth of video that I can take. Way easier than trying to sit there and take pictures. Another one is this key fob. This little guy, same thing, 32 gig SD card, hours and hours of video. What's the next one? Yeah. The other greatest one is I was doing a chemical company. They told me that they have HID cards. That's what their badging system was. No pictures, no nothing. They didn't tell me what color it was. I found out from the Starbucks I was at, buying the four things of coffee, that their colored badges are red. Well, a little Sharpie here and there goes a long way because if you can tell, that ain't a red badge. That's a white badge with fucking red Sharpie. <laughs> but it worked. How, how many of you guys uh, literally have a no tailgating policy at your jobs? How many of you actually will get fired if you let tailgating happen? You do? Go get that man a beer. At least he works for a good company. <laughs> The other question is, how many of you guys have companies that actually enforce it with some sort of man trap? Oh, you guys got man traps? Turnstiles or both locking doors? Oh, nice. All right. Very cool. Would you like a nice warm Coors Light, sir? All righty. I've got a knife if you want to. Uh, who else wants too. a nice warm Coors Light? Because we still got like sixteen of these things. We've been really bad about giving these out, so give it. Yeah. I've also got a knife See, for those who want to, you know, be adventurous and shotgun. <laughs> I bring my own because it's been in a cooler for like twenty-four hours, so my mountains are blue. <laughs> How about you, Mr. Dan? You've been you've been quiet. You've been, I would. I mean, come on, you did drop that, you know, whole billboard thing and got that all was you. got that all was famous. You. I heard that was you, right? <laughs> Someone's put on the spot. Actually, I have a fun story regarding that exact slide. The first time I ever did that was for ETAC in San Diego in 2008. I wanted to go to a conference and I was, um, how old was I? Seven? I don't know. Anyway. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, same exact deal. Uh, I went 
to um, the con, and like this gentleman in the back of the camera, I was like, oh, I'm a voice photographer guy. So I walked around uh, the conference area with the, the coffee shop and ran into a friend of mine. And I was like, hey, let me take a picture, picture of your badge. I want to see if I can like, be their staff photographer next year, and I want to like, show them a portfolio. He said, yeah, sure. So I took like a 12 megapixel high resolution photo of the badge. And, Went to Kinko's, printed it out, did exactly this. Went to Office Depot, and they had these blue, the blue badge carriers at Office Depot. Well, they had white ones, and then they had blue, like cellophane for um, overhead projectors. So I just printed it out, and people did it. And it was just like, it has to look legit at 10 feet, and that's that's it. If, if, if it can look legit at 10 feet, then like, so you're saying, you're in, done, good. Because generally speaking, these conferences and other people hire the hotel security people to do the security. And those guys are going to sit on a chair 10 feet away from the people coming in and out of the door, so it just has to look legit at 10 feet. So you blend into the herd in like Assassin's Creed mode, which you're in, done, boom, finish. And you enter like the fucking war droids and shells for everyone. Getting pictures of people's cards. Actually, I think I only became staff photographer at Defcon was because I was taking pictures of people and I didn't get killed because of it. There was a there was a um, couple weeks ago, or it was it last month? Um, Snooze was in town, and so Gotti and I we met up with him, and there was this guy. He would not shut up. He was a sales droid for um, I don't know some company. He kept talking to us and talking to us. So like, hey, hey, man, um, I got this. Um, so he mentioned my company that he had a card, but it was through a different processor, which was really weird because my company doesn't is a processor, a bank. So I've narrowed it down to two companies I work for now. <laughs> Maybe three. But the point is that he had this card with a weird processor on it. So I'm like, hey man, look, you know, can I take a picture of this or something like that? And the guy just pull, whips it out and start, and uh, they were backing me up. It was hilarious. But we start, start taking pictures of this dude's cards, his, light, his wallet. It was, when he, he means cards, we're talking credit cards. And the back of it to make sure that it was legitimate because I said I needed to see the processor name written across the signing area of the card. Because I worked for the company and I was able to produce a card that said, hey, I work for this company. You should totally trust me. And he did. It was really weird. And you'll be amazed at what you can get just by asking. Yeah, it's crazy. Uh, one thing that I didn't put in the slides because he brought it up. Uh, so since this is like a pro sysadmin tips or whatever, yeah. how many of you guys use cameras on site, like for your doors or anything like that? Have you all tested your blind spots? Because more often than not, I've been on so many pen test engagements where it's kind of like the sniper syndrome, if you guys know what a sniper is, but a 100 feet out, a guy can hide behind a tree but if he does this, you're going to see him playing his day. Same with the cameras. The camera could be pointing like this, but you could just like back up against that wall, just kind of do this, and the camera don't see shit. My buddy Pyro, I think all of you might know him from DEF CON. I know Pyro. Everybody knows Pyro. <laughs> if you've ever watched the TV show he was on, they broke into a facility where all he had to do was get really, really low and crawl on his belly down the stairs and the camera and motion sensors didn't pick him up. And that's like the tips that I would say on the pen test side, I mean, definitely social uh, awareness is a big thing. Like you guys need to educate your users because your users are the number one target. And if he goes to the next slide, which I think you heard about this in my talk yesterday. Oh, the, wait, those are the tools. Keep going. Okay, so on the social engineering aspect, I have two ways. I'm, do, I'm the physical guy and I'm the social engineering guy, and I usually make the phone calls and do all the email tricks. But I have a 95% success rate because of a Citrix telecommute portal. I, will, I have this nice little template, looks exactly like a Citrix tele, a portal, and I send out an email saying, hey, company X, blah, 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 we're sending you the beta link for our new te beta telecommuting test. Click on this link, use your normal creds that you would for your Windows workstation, log into it, and let us know. And this thing, literally 95% of the time, people log in with their NTLM creds, and all I gotta do is RDP into it, and that engagement is over. 
So I would say if you guys have a fishing, uh, at least policy in place, read it and learn it. If you, any of you guys in security, like actually security minded, what kind of security? I know, I know yours. What about you back there? Okay. Do you guys ever do phishing campaigns internally to test your users? Oh, that's badass. Get what that guy another work beer. For? I like, who do you work for, dude? For insurance company. Uh, at least he didn't tell us. Well done, sir. <laughs> Get that man a beer. Yeah. Who's the beer slut? Or oh, beer that's host, that's or, that was not man. politically correct. Who who else uh, does any? What do you do? <laughs> we all get a hand for this. Who's gonna be our beer slut? No, no, no. Oh, all right, fine. Security architect. Do you? So you basically do the policies, procedures, and then more than. Oh, okay. So that's good. Do you guys do anything like that? Internal phishing. That's bad. What platform do either of you use? Ha. <laughs> You know the, my awesome. company, well, yeah. not nah, we built that. Right Just saying. This one is mine. The one in Fishing Frenzy, that, that one, that's mine. Yay for me. On that note, you guys got any questions? Because I'm going to drink more beer. We're going Oh, you told me about that yesterday. Yeah, that, that seemed to work. That, that's cool. I like that. I had a, I had a physical pen test out in Southern California and, uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I got in 9 a.m. Fine. I got, I showed up to the office around 8.30 and started to watch people walk in. Standard operating procedure. You're doing recon, right? So I walk in. I follow somebody into the to the office. I sit down in the first conference room I see, and this one walks in, and she says, oh, I'm sorry. I didn't realize you were here so early for the meeting. Uh, I'll, I'll leave you alone. No, it's okay. I'll get out of your way. So I pick up my shit, pack up, unplug from the uh, network cable that I had taken from the projector that was a network-based projector, and she didn't find it suspicious at all. So I'm cool. So I go to the next conference room I find and sit down and do the same thing. Nobody's bothering me. I've time for lunch, go get lunch, come back, wait for somebody to let me in again. And I find another conference room. It's, it's Unfortunately, this one's all glass. So the glass walls, glass door in front. And what ended up happening is about 45 minutes into me taking over this, this network that I had just breached, uh, this woman walks in and says, I've got this room reserved. I'm like, no, you don't. And she asked me, are you an employee? Not gonna lie to her. Yes, I'm an employee. <laughs> <laughs> and so I, I, I went from there. To, and I, I'm like, look, I've got this room, this room reserved. Come look at the calendar invite. No, 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 it's okay. I'm gonna go check mine. Okay, cool. So as she came, she leaves. I pack up my shit. I move to the next conference room over, which is also glass, the glass wall and the glass door and the glass everything. And I sit down, I plug in. And she comes back to the room where she, she came to initially looks at me in the room next to it, looks at the room that's now empty, and just sits down and says, okay. So I invaded that one pretty easily. <laughs> cool. Yeah. Um, It, it really depends. So on the awareness of the people around me, if I don't do my job properly and I show up looking in suit and tie and these guys are all like jeans and t-shirt, pretty obvious, right? So um, if somebody is like about to throw a flag, I know how to get the fuck out. You can tell that by body language is confrontational, it's aggressive, it's who are you, what are you doing? So, but beyond that, it's, it's not typically a, uh, there's no average. It's just a matter of feeling the situation out. So, uh, actually, I just did that. <laughs> <laughs> so I went into a, an office, a small, like, remote office in uh, a, a major city, and I walked in with a fake letter of authorization. Uh, I prepared, of course, beforehand. I uh, 
said, I'm a, this, this person is here to perform tests. He's a network engineer for this other company. Please allow him access. And I pulled a coworker's name, put him on his point of contacts as the director of IT. Uh, and then I went online and I found a, a site that creates signatures, like just ad hoc. It like looks like handwritten signatures. And uh, I put it, I copied it, pasted it, put it on the bottom of the signature. And she goes, who's this guy, Alton? I don't, I don't know who Alton is. Like, you can call him, but I mean, he's a director. It's pretty busy. And once you say, you can call him if you want, they're like, no, I trust you. Because if you're offering for them to call them, then that means that you're OK with them vetting you. So let's not bother the director today. Um, and actually, with that, I, I <laughs> they had a, it was a fun physical. Um, I could have, I stole three Blackberries uh, that was in a recycling bin. It was an electronic recycling, which is a cardboard box with a Sharpie written on electronics and battery recycling. And I walk out, I wonder what's in there. Oh, three Blackberries, cool, let's take those. And of course, there's company email saying how much money they're donating to a political campaign. So, sensitive information done right there. <clears throat> and there's also two switches. So if I had brought a TV box like Brad, I could have taken two switches with me. That would have been awesome. Cool. Yeah. Cool. So physical like appearance, usually in the kickoff call, I'll ask ahead of time, hey, Mr. Client, will you tell me what your dress code is so I don't have to you know, show up three days before and start recon? Yeah, sure, here it is, dress code. Just you know, standard business casual, if it's in California, sandals and you know, shorts, or if it's in New York. <laughs> Dude, going in as the so janitor. So YouTube's though? fantastic for Sorry. blending. YouTube is fantastic to be used. A lot of companies will pull up training videos. So I mean, if you look through who my LinkedIn, look who I've worked for and such, and you go hit those each of those companies up, you'll see that each of those companies has training videos, and I'm in like one company's. It's every single one of them. And you'll see the dress code. You'll see, you know, what's done. And I always looked at this going, this is a stupid policy. We shouldn't be putting this up on YouTube. And what's great is when they put their badges up on YouTube. So thank you for that, right? So uh, typically it's, it's just look for those public resources. Um, and if you don't, they're available, show up the day before and go find the nearest Starbucks, the nearest whatever. Make sure there's like a Hagger's clothing around or... Uh, just a bank if there's a high end place, and if not, just you know, wear whatever. So it is a matter of like physical reason. The day before, if I can't find anything online, if it's like my engagement is to show up and be there by 9 a.m., I'll, I'll fly in at 7, get off there, get off the plane, go, do, done. So physical pen test is typically, unless there's guns involved, is uh, is plans and researched, but it's all off the cuff when you get there. You've got your scenario. Work from there. Anybody else? So in a downtown major metropolitan area, they had the same setup. Um, and it's really wonderful when everybody's I walked into the facility, it was a shared facility like yours. There were like three, uh, 30 or 40 tenants, large, large skyscraper. And what ended up happening is I got either lucky or I was good. I don't know which one yet. Um, I walked in as around 4.30, people were leaving. So the security card guard was blinded by the fact that I was walking in. The elevator doors was open. So I just walked in the elevator doors and pushed the button and got on the executive floor. So typically with, with uh, a physical security for, for a building, it's, it's not terribly difficult. They don't exactly hire um, like people who are, are looking for every single person or vetting every single person. Um, they just want to get their job done, their shift over, and go home. So it's not terribly hard. 
Um, and it, when I was in DC, I did the same thing. Actually, they had actually had an armed physical security guard, but it was 7:30 in the morning, and I walked in with a rush. They're not checking every single person; they're just looking for a beep, or if even. Yeah. And grab a beer too. Who wants the next beer? No, dude, you got to drink that. Nah, I hate beer. Oh I would have drank the bourbon if you, if you brought No, No, that's not, not the key. Back. Uh, I was just going to say, uh, on the financial front, uh, I work in a downtown building in Chicago. On the financial front, if you walk in the front door, go straight to the desk and tell them you work for KPG, and mention whoever the most important person is at your office. They'll usually give you a page, paper bag. Oh, sorry. Uh, <laughs> they'll uh, they'll give you a paper badge and let you right through up to the floor. And, <laughs> I'm not going to say. Uh, it used to happen in our building, but all those people got fired. Um, also, if you wait till shortly before lunch and come in in a suit, they assume you're a vendor and you can tailgate the vendors pretty easily without anybody caring. So. Yeah. Next slide. Uh, where's Brad? Did Brad walk out. Mm -hmm. He's smoking. Yeah, he's moving on to. I mean, we, we don't need airspace fill, but I'd like your pro tip because you're Dan Tentler. <laughs> right. So from personal experience, like um, if anybody in the crowd is considering or runs uh, in-house um, fishing sort of protection uh, program, like the gentleman in the back was saying earlier that. Uh, he, his organization fishes everyone every three weeks. <clears throat> if you incentivize doing better instead of punishing people that don't do well, then you can get crazy buy-in from the employee base. And I say this because I developed Twitter's phishing defense program, and we basically treated it like spy mode. We we're like, oh, you want to come play with the hackers? You want to be a spy guy? You want to do like the Hollywood stuff? And we rewarded people with like, custom hoodies and challenge coins and things. So if, if you do the, the, the polar opposite, instead of the typical corporate approach is do this, follow the policy, or you're fired. Or, you know, or they send everybody to a class and you have to like take two days out of your work and all your shit falls behind while you're doing this bullshit class and you're sat in this and you're just playing on your phone the whole time. Or, no, that's stupid. Um, incentivize being better instead of punishing people that lag behind and you'll get so much more buy-in. If you have one employee walking around the office with a custom embroidered North Face jacket that says like pound security, everyone's going to go, who the fuck is that? And like, how did he get that, that jacket? That's amazing. I want one. And that's exactly what you want. It, um, abuse people's, um, uh, tendency to want to be vain or get free stuff. Because if you take that and you use that momentum instead of punishing people, um, you'll turn it into an internal challenge. If you give two or three people in the organization as effectively plants, you just tell them, look, I'm going to give you this awesome $110 jacket. Don't tell anybody where you got it. If they ask you, literally answer, that's classified. Straight up. And then everyone Everybody will go to the InfoSec department at the company and say, how the fuck do I get one of those? And that's exactly what you want. And you say, all you got to do is pass all the phishing tests. And they'll be like, rad, show them to me. Because they want the thing. So you abuse their, uh, their mental reasoning for wanting the thing. So do that. It works. Believe me, I've done it. It's good. What? Yes, it works in more than just security. Abuse people's um, inclination to be vain and want expensive things. Because, say again? Yes, yes. If you, you, you turn it into a race. Like, if, if the most secure 10 people in the company get this thing and then people will go nuts. Don't forget the money. 200 person company, if that same approach works. Work with Twitter. Protect when the SEA hit us in 2012, not a single fucking click. I'll take all the credit for that. Thank you. Very much. <laughs> so, like, I'm just saying, like, it's open source. Take it, use it, do it. It's fucking gold. Don't I'll don't turn it. I have a whole talk for that, but I don't want to detract from the people on stage. <laughs> so, alternative, one more thing. If you do do a phishing engagement with anybody, just make sure that when you're given the results, you don't punish those people. 
they're they're doing their job. They're, if if I'm calling a company and they're asking for my you know ID number, great. However, if they don't ask for my ID, it's not that they're bad. It's that they made a mistake. Don't fire them. It's not appropriate. But at this point, it's actually belt face. Oh hi. <laughs> hey guys. So um, real quick, to set some ex expectations about the next like ten slides. Um, so when I was writing these on the on the drive down here, um, I just grabbed these from my works uh, evidence folder. So what you're going to see, these are all going to be real web app um, pen tests done against real banks, real credit card companies, and uh, at the end, one real ICS device. How many people in here have ever used a web app? All right, I saw like 10 people not raise their hands, so either you're just ignoring me or I'm really offended. You. If you, it's all right, they make these like, you know, sound things and it just yells at you the whole time. Yeah, that's it. I, I heard you can get that on the Googles. So the, so do we have actually any uh, web app pen testers in here? Anyone who does web app work? Anybody who's heard of Burp? Awesome. How many people have heard of Zap? Burp is better than Zap. I don't care what you say. I don't care if you're from OWASP. I'm not going to apologize. Burp's better. Use Burp. Burp's pretty great, though. Um, and the, we're going to talk about that in a sec. But with web app pen testing, it's kind of interesting because it's not the same as a internal pen test. It's, it's a little closer to a physical pen test. You kind of got to feel out your target because when you make your get request, you're not getting the back end code. You're getting the response from the server. It, you're getting the HTML. Maybe you're getting a little Ajax. Maybe you're getting a little JavaScript. But you're getting what the server wants you to see. You're not getting to see what's in the background. So you kind of got to get, get in the head of the, uh, of the developer. And it gets really easy when you work internal because you know all the developers and they reuse all their code. <laughs> so we had a, um, you're going to see in a second, we had a messaging application that had stored cross-site scripting in it. And so we, we found it, we reported on it, they fixed it. And then the next week, when we were doing the pen test on the next application, because they just rolled out an, uh, a change, the XSS was in there. They did no regression testing. And if you're unfamiliar with regression testing, that's where they take the code and they, um, any reused code, and they start testing that segment and the previous segment and the previous segment to make sure no matter what re reused code you use, it always is fixed. And regression testing for developers is, I mean, if you're not doing it, you're, you're just going to have the same problems over and over again as we're going to see. So a real quick overview of uh, Burp, because I've got like five minutes left. Um, these are all the different, uh, actually my, my highlights didn't get through. Oh well. So most people who've used Burp, I'm assuming you're familiar with Target, Proxy, and the scanner, right? And, well, yeah, Intruder is great. <laughs> you get to, Intruder is a brute forcing, is the brute forcing part of it. Um, but going down the list, Spider is amazing. If you don't have that turned on, definitely turn that on because what that's going to do is it's got a whole list of um, directories to try. And so it's just going to brute force that entire directory tree. With um, Scanner, obviously, most people are familiar with that, it scans shit. I mean, it's pretty easy to remember. Uh, Intruder is going to be your brute forcer. Repeater is really cool. You can take a request that you're, that you have or even a uh, response. You can toss it in there, modify it however you want and just run it over and over and over again, changing different values to do some manual fuzzing. Sequencer, I have, has anybody in here ever used Sequencer? Does anybody in here know what Sequencer does? <laughs> sequencer is the shit. So what you can do is, you know, everyone knows, you know, cookies, session tokens, all that. You can run them through Sequencer and it will run the request hundreds of thousands of times to get a gigantic sampling of them and then tell you the relative entropy of, of that uh, particular uh, um, cookie or session value. From there then you can, if they have a very low entropy, you can brute force sessions and steal people's sessions. It's great. Um, Decoder does like some ASCII and HTML encoding and uh, compare will compare two different responses. And Extender, you can write different stuff for uh, Burp. So this is all the boring stuff that I wanted to include for the educational value. The rest of it's all bragging. So what's out there? So the first thing that you're going to hear about is autocomplete. Autocomplete needs to be turned off on all of them, and you see it everywhere. Because if you do get cross-site scripting, you can dump that entire database, that autocomplete database. You can pull out people's passwords. You can pull it. It's great. 
boring as hell and pretty much useless in a, a proper pen test. Cross-site scripting. Everybody here familiar with cross-site scripting? Uh, cross there we go. <laughs> <laughs> Because I was lazy as fuck and wanted to send it to the developers because, all right, so all of our developers, I'm not going to give away too many company secrets, but let's just say that English is a second language and they don't really understand the, like, significance of a document.cookie. Do they understand meat spin? <laughs> 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 they understand that a lot better. No, but they do understand goatee. How many spins do you have? <laughs> <laughs> You're speaking your right language. <laughs> So the other one, this one was kind of cool. So if you're in a company and you can find uh, web services, half, so again, I work for a bank, a big Fortune 500. None of the web services had authorization. And the giant white spaces are me redacting it so you can't, you know, Google this shit. But I can send an XML and get a response. And if you see right here, it says balance transfer. Okay, so because it's tight, this is burp output. That says balance transfer. If I wanted to, I could have started taking, you know, $10,000 from, you know, one credit card, let's say a Visa, and drop it on to another credit card, say, if I were have to work for Visa. It would have been very, very nice. Yes? I heard of a case like that. Someone actually did that, but he did it like 10,000 times. And it's like a Superman uh, crime of like a half a cent on each or something. Yes. Yes, it's... Those hackers, man, they're kind of dicks. Oh, we've only got... We've got four minutes left. I don't mean to interrupt, but I'm just going to blast through these last few slides. So this is another... Cro this is more cross-site scripting, and this was in the bank account number field. You just drop it in. It doesn't actually accept it because it does a client-side check, but if you change the get request through the intercepting proxy, you can just drop cross-site scripting all day. More bad forms, so you can't see it right here, but this says full name, customer type, password, role, fulfillment ID. And this would be all right, maybe, if it weren't going to a third party, and, you know, if it wasn't sending the password hash over HTTP. Yeah. Now, here's another funny thing. Have... <laughs> Give him a beer. Give him a beer. Funny story, that actually wasn't the password, they just named it terribly. So that's something else that you have to work with, is terrible developers naming things terribly. So this actually wasn't a vulnerability, but the way they named it made it so. And here's even more XSS. This one was awesome, because see where it says improperly handled input on the top? That's because that's what I inserted into the user agent. It printed the user agent into an HTML comment on the web page. What's that? A, absolutely HTML injection. You can get cross-site scripting. It's beautiful. Base 64 encryption. I, I know, that's, that's the joke. So this was great. I did a password reset. I did a password reset on one of the users. And I got the pa I got my own password back because the account was locked out. I'm like, the fuck's going so apparently they were like, no, 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 we use a proprietary, as soon as I say proprietary encryption, that's game over. Bidirectional proprietary encryption. No. No, 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 no. And here's all the XSS. This is the stored one in the message. So this would actually hit the back office application, and you could run Beast, or I'm uh, Beast, Beef. You could uh, Beef all the uh, analysts and all the customer service representatives' uh, browsers on the back end, which was hilarious. Uh, this was a file path manipulation. You really can't see it, but this was in a, this is a Java request uh, to a DB2 server, and on the right side, that is the FTP manager um, configuration file with usernames and passwords. Now, this last one is an unpublished ODA in a industrial control system um, gateway. So it, it uh, hits GSM. You can connect through GSM and hit all the SCADA controllers and everything like that. This isn't how we found it, but you can see right here I run strings on the binary, or that was uh, the actual firmware I downloaded from their website. And if you see down here, it says admin upload.htm, which is fine if you need to upload things. What's not fine is being able to get to that without authenticating, and then having that being able to overwrite index.html, or you know, really pretty much anything else on the actual gateway that's publicly available. So we are way out of time, but back to you guys. Yeah.